Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Without question, the pandemic has changed all of our lives. There have already been dozens of books covering many aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, from Scott Gottlieb's New York Times bestseller, Uncontrolled Spread, to LaSalle author Pam Stradesky's children's book, Coronavirus Came to Town. Windsor author Stephen Christoph's new book addresses how the pandemic has not only affected our emotional, social, political, and spiritual health, but that of our country and beyond. His book outlines the challenges we've faced and provides coping tools, and it will not only resonate with readers in Essex County, but the world over. Feeling Normal Again is about healing and hope. Having known Stephen for over 30 years, I'm very pleased to welcome him to Scribes and Songsters to discuss his book, Feeling Normal Again, A Post-Pandemic Guide to Emotional Health. Welcome. Thank you, Bernie. I'm very happy to be here. Well, congratulations. I'm delighted for you. Is this your first book? It's my first finished book and published oh. book. <laughs> there, there are others. Um, but uh, I, as you know, I retired from a chunk of my career about a year ago, a bit more than a year ago. And it's amazing what that time allows you to do. So uh, yeah, this is first, but there's others coming up. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Now, um, you have a disclaimer mm -hmm. at the beginning of the book. Could you tell us a little about that? M my concern was that anybody uh, accessing this book might think it's, it's a... Uh, it's a replacement uh, for mental for a mental health professional. It's not. Um, this is written from from the point of view that um, many people, many people around the world, are feeling a, a sense of abnormality. They're they're searching for normality in their lives, and it's it's not necessarily something that is um, a mental illness. Uh, and really, what the book does is it provides, uh, as you know. A bunch of strategies or tools within toolboxes that are accessible they're available to people and it's and it really comes from a great deal of research uh and and synthesize the research and put it back in a way that is very understandable to the average person now of course with the disclaimer uh i want to make sure that if anybody identifies through this that wait a second there's something amiss here there's something more than just uh i'm out of whack here i'm you know and and and, and I repeat it, as you saw throughout the book uh, time and time again, that uh, if somebody does suspect that there's a serious problem to consult, first of all, their family physician, their GP, and get a referral, uh, follow it up professionally, because this is not a replacement for diagnosis or coming up with some sort of a, a plan. And you, you seem to make it clear that you're not passing yourself off as a professional therapist, which I think makes the book a uh, very real as well and that and that's the goal yes i, I you know i hope that uh, i mean there's there's obviously the, the issue with with um getting too technical mm -hmm. and and i want to make sure that this is something that most people understand um there might be something in this for you and as you talk with your neighbor your coworker, whoever it is your relative uh, we we're just finding that there are so many things that that people share um because of this pandemic due to due to the fallout and uh and, and so because there are these shared issues and impacts there there's a lot of advice in here that i think can do some good so before we get to that um tell us a little bit about yourself you've had quite a career i have i have um first off family man um my family my spirituality is you know number <laughs> number one in my life uh, and I've been I've been blessed with uh, really the opportunity to do many things. As I just mentioned, I I retired, kind of retired from from the probably the longest chunk of my career so far, and that was in education. And uh, I, I taught uh, media, communications, photography, graphic design, broadcasting, things that you're familiar with, <laughs> uh, for about 26 or 27 years. Wow! And uh, and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, 
And prior to that, I've had experiences. Um, uh, I owned a career counseling company for several years. I, I ran a small ad agency. I worked for a, a Fortune 500 company um, as a, a supervisory employment consultant and uh, and yet other things. So yeah, I've, 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 I've had a lot of different experiences and it's been a great ride so far. And so um, what was the like the genesis for this book? What did you wake up one morning and decide you wanted to do it? Or, you know, how did you come to the conclusion uh, you wanted to do it's, this? It's, it's far less uh, interesting. That I, I was <laughs> doing a mundane task. I was cleaning the garage, which I hate to do. And, and <laughs> there with my thoughts alone and, and trying to think of anything other than where do I put this stuff? And I just kept ruminating on this idea that the people that I've spoken with um, and it really within the past, and we're going back to uh, the beginning of the summer now. And, and for the past year and a half, I'm thinking, I keep hearing the same thing. Uh, and, and, and I'm hearing it not just in my personal conversations within my network, but on TV and in, in things I read. And it's just this idea that um, people just don't feel normal. And, and they know that in, it's in some way connected to the pandemic, but they're grasping. They don't know how or why, and, and the, the, I think the worst part is that I keep hearing that they don't know how to get back to normal. So I, I'm thinking about this, and, I, and I, it was like epiphany. And I thought, oh my God, this, this, this could be a great premise for a book. And, I, and moreover, um, I think it might do an awful lot of uh, you know, help. And so, so I, I explored it and I started writing it. I didn't really get, um, I would say the, the bulk of the writing when I really started powering into it uh, was the beginning of the fall. Wow. So. And it's interesting, in September, um, Statistics Canada uh, released data that centered around the mental health of Canadians uh, for a good reason. And among their findings was that community belonging and life satisfaction had dropped. Mm -hmm. So from what you know, do you think this is universal to all ages? Um, from what I've gleaned, uh, I, I, I believe that we're looking at uh, more prevalence in the boomer generation. Uh, younger people are feeling it. It, it, it depends on what segment you're looking at. Uh, our, our really young people, uh, they're feeling it in droves. It's awful. Um, now, they're not going to be reading a book like this. Right, right? their parents But will. their parents may. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, when, when we get to school-age children, and, and when I say school-age, I mean, not just you know JK through eight, high school, but, but college and university, um, it's, it's just, uh, a whole bunch of upheaval. And so it's hitting that um, generation. And, and then we get to people who are, again, in the boomers. And, and I think because of perspective, it's hit them particularly hard. Did you see it in your students before uh, you retired? Uh, I, I taught, um, I was teaching remotely from, when was it, the end of March break, 20, mm -hmm. 2019? Nine. 2020. 20? 2019. Yeah, 2020. Oh my goodness, 2020. Right. This is, was yeah. it 2020? See, I mean, this is wow. the thing. This is the thing that it's, it's just, it's been a whirlwind. Yes. And, and we we lose sight of how much we've gone through in, in what time frame. But, but yes, I was I was teaching uh, remotely uh, from home and it was it was odd. And I, I mean, you, it, it doesn't replace live in person, no matter how much you want it to. And I, I enjoyed that. I made the most of it. And, and many of my students were, you know, it was uncharted territory for us. So for instance, in teaching photography, it was interesting because uh, we were doing crits, critiques, and the kids would upload their pictures and show them on their screen. Everybody saw them, and, and students were actually commenting, which was interesting. But there was something that was really missing. And, and just that uh, uncertainty. Uh, my concern, my concern is that, um, and I really hope this doesn't happen, but I'm concerned that we're going to have a, a generation, a cohort, if you will, that will be forever referred to as the the pandemic cohort or the or right. COVID cohort. Um, and yeah, because their academics certainly have been impacted. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, another thing you very early in the book, you talk about the new normal and how that was a, a smack in the face almost. Yeah, I, I don't know about you, Vernick, but I hated hearing that term. And from mm -hmm. the very beginning, and I was starting to hear it as early as April, you know, right after it, it, it started rolling. And so, well, this is going to be the new normal. No, it's not. 
Okay, first of all, and I and I've found myself arguing with with friends and family, and, and say so you, you can't say that because it's a dangerous term, and it's not a new term. You know, as I point out in the book, the term was first um, seen in print. I think it was in 1918, just uh, uh, after the First World War, um, and and so this every time that there's a calamity, every time that there's there's you know some sort of a crisis event uh, in history, people will tend to focus on this new normal thing. It's it's just semantics, right? Yeah. Or is it? Because the problem is, um, what what we've done is, we, many people have kind of fallen into this pit, and it's 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 depressive, um, and they're looking at the this idea that they can't get back to normal because things have changed. Well, yeah, things have changed. Things do change. I mean, that's the nature of life, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't mean that you can't get back to enjoying life and feeling peace and getting rid of that angst and all of that sort of thing. So. Um, I, I had a problem because I, I with it because I think it, it its definition is is wrong. I mean, look at nine eleven, right? Do, did we what did we lose? How did life change? How did life become a again for the sake of saying the term uh, new normal? You you look at the shift not just in the United States and Canada but around the world towards security. I mean, it, it was so easy to board a plane before, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And now it's. Yeah, it's grim. a hassle. It's a, yes. yeah. um, there's aspects of it that are not very fun at all. And that's not, I don't think that's ever going to change. But it doesn't mean that we don't enjoy life and we adapt, right? So we don't let our circumstances define us and our, our sense of normality or a sense of enjoying life. Uh, we need to roll with it, right? And and you're right, because even though security has been, after 9-11, in, in the years following, n not the immediate, uh, and security uh, measures, you know, became uh, grim, but our lives continued. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't as though everyday life changed, and it only changed f for those immediate months and uh, following the 9-11. Uh, the and so, you, I can see where you're coming from, where you don't want it a new normal to be, uh, and right now everybody's living in fear. Yes. Yeah. And even, I mean, it, it, it goes to the point of what is normal. I, mean, I, I had a discussion last night with a, a close friend and he had just finished reading the book and he called me and actually he texted me first and he said, I can't do this on texts. <laughs> and and he was he said it just got has my brain synapses popping, and uh, we got talking about this and, and um, the idea of, of normal is it, it's an elusive thing to try to define. I mean, what's normal for for you and me? Let let me say what's normal for me may be frightening to you, right? Absolutely, I mean, they're, they're subjective and, and they're highly personal, and they change. They're fluid. <laughs> I mean, normality isn't the same. So this new normal, I, I, I look at it and think, well, yeah, it's always a new normal, right? Next week I may have a, a new normal, but that is not a reason to, to get in the dumps and feel that life is over and lose hope. There are things that we can do to, to cope. Like, like in the book, it says resilience is, is key. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so when you look at uh, this, th this period of time, um, what do you think has been the greatest challenge for people? I, I mean, and, and do you think that that varies? Uh, I think it across, does. I think yeah. it does vary. But I think one one thing that's probably um, I think most people share it, and, and it's the social element. Uh, I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's what keeps us ticking, right? I mean, people. How many people have been shifted to home offices? You know, working remotely, and and a lot of those people, when given the chance, they've gone back, and that's the reason. Now, in some cases, it's structure; they've lost structure, right? But in a lot of cases, just I, I, this is great and everything, but I need to be with people. So I think the social element and the in the loss of it, the social isolation, um, has done a lot of damage. I think a lot of people are feeling yeah. that. Yeah, and you ask in the book, how are you feeling? What are the kinds of things that people uh, can learn about themselves? Uh, as they live through this pandemic? Well, I think it comes back to um, to the, that, that term again, resilience, right? We, you know people, I know people um, who are just as resilient, resilient as 
Oh, mm-hmm. unbelievable. You know, they never catch a cold. And if they do, they, they shake it within a half a day. Yeah. Um, and it's not just the physical, it's the emotional. They bounce, it's, it's the bouncing back thing. And I think a lot of people have found that uh, they're probably um, more resilient than they thought that they were. But then there's the other half or three quarters or whatever the, of the world who are finding that I'm not as resilient as I thought I was. I've lost hopes far too easily in the face of this. And it's understandable. It's, it's really twisted yeah. things for us. What are some of the impacts? Talk, uh, sort of take us through some of the impacts that um, you list in the book. I, we do. I do look at um, some of the political impact because that's that's tied, unfortunately, to the pandemic. And <clears throat> excuse me, it's not a political book, um, it, but there are there are truths, uh, objective truths that need to be explored in order to understand, you know, why we are where we are right now. And one of those, for instance, is is divisiveness. I mean, we live in a time that uh, I don't know about you, but to me, I can't remember uh, life and people and, and governments and parties and so on and so forth being as divisive as, as they are. I mean, I, the whole idea of, of collaboration is out the window. It's just it's, it's a versus mentality. And you see it not just in, in those things. It's, it's in everyday interactions with people and behaviors. And people are angry mm-hmm. you know, on my way to the studio. Um, I made a turn, a right hand turn, and um, somebody else is making a turn. And, and as it turned, as it turned out, um, I actually had the right of way. Uh, but the, the, the other driver was just so angry. We didn't even come close, but he had to express himself. He had to, you know, somehow yell. And, and, it, and it came out in the horn and the finger movements and whatever <laughs> else, right? So I think we're all feeling. But, the, you know, the other impacts, of course, um, and that's what the book uh, focuses on my, primarily are the emotional impacts. So things like, for instance, malaise, uh, and I start the impacts with, with that. And a lot of people really don't understand what malaise is, but when they look at the, the indicators, they start, yeah, you know, that's me. I, I'm not really looking forward to, to doing anything. And people who you were previously very active are inactive for the most part. So there's that. There's um, uh, the, the idea of social um, unpreparedness. Uh, people are, you know, just now some folks are being comfortable with getting back together. Now we'll see what happens with Omicron or Omicron, um, yeah. you know, and is that going to knock us back? Other people have been socializing and just being careful. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then you have a whole set of people who are, they're unfamiliar. It seems like they've never socialized before. Um, they're afraid of entertaining in their own homes or going yeah. somewhere or meeting somebody in a restaurant. Uh, so there, there are some, you know, some very personal impacts there, um, there, there are some, you know, more esoteric things, but it's, it's had a lot. And you talk about the divisiveness and, um, do you feel that governments have contributed to that divisiveness where it's made families scared of each other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know that any, I, I mean, I'm not willing to go that far as to say that any government is purposely uh, trying to divide, you know, their, their, their nation. Right. But I think that there are parties, mm-hmm. right. And, and parties, plural. Yes. Right. Yes. And, yes. And, and I think uh, that's absolutely. the other thing. Is, I mean, I can't write a book like this and say, Hey, we need collaboration and say, but it's all you. Oh, no, no. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that doesn't quite wash. So, um, I, I think, yes, uh, they're trying to win at all costs, trying to win over by, by using and skewing facts and figures. Um, by skewing, uh, look, I mean, I, I have a whole section, well, a, a small section here about the, the hoaxes or, or the, the uh, fallacies about the vaccine. Um, wow. I mean, there's some stuff in there and, and I, I, I mean, it wasn't hard to find this and it's all over the place. So, you, you know, some of the divisiveness, yes, it's coming from, from parties and it's condoned and it's, it's unabashed. I mean, you've seen it. I've seen, we've all seen it. There's lies. And that's another thing. I mean, didn't we learn from our parents? that um, lying is a bad thing. But it seems as yeah. though um, even at the highest level, and I think that's yeah. what, you know, also many people are getting so fed up with what they're hearing from the people at the top who are um, every other week, there's something different. They tell you do this and then that's going to happen. Yeah. And people are saying, like enough already. Yeah. And there's confusion too. Yes. I mean, look at, um, we, we just passed us Thanksgiving and 
you know, I was watching a few football games and whatever, and I'm looking, I'm thinking, okay, so something's not meshing here. We're, we're being told that we still need masks in public places. Don't sit too close to anybody or stand close to them, even in, in an outdoor setting, um, et cetera. All of the, you know, various precautions that we're taking. But look at this. Here's here's 60,000 or 150,000 fans all together hugging, screaming, and not a mask to be found. And everything seems like it's done, but it's not. So, yeah, there's there's conflicting messages. Now, um, you've got a very practical list of personal emotional tools in in the book um, that people can put in a coping toolbox. Right. Tell us some of those. Let me look at a few mm-hmm. that I had flagged here. Because um, it's it really uh, is um, a tremendously practical book. There, yes, um, thank you. And and I think, you know, one of the things that, that um, we really need to look at is worry, worry and anxiety. And, and obviously, um, anxiety uh, can be a, a very serious uh, mental illness, and it, it often comes, uh, comes with depression. Uh, this is something that uh, is way beyond the scope of this book, but uh, on an average level, your average individual has found, many of them have found that they're far more anxious than they were before this pandemic. And it's, and I think part of it is that, that, that whiplash effect, right? You're, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the waves that we've gone through. We're back at this again, and we're locked down again and so on and so forth. So it, it creates, uh, an anxiety. And uh, you know, one thing is as a tool, for instance, um, when we talk about anxiety is this idea that, um, even, you know, when we worry about things, uh, 90% of the time, the worst thing doesn't happen, you know, or it doesn't go wrong. And when it does go wrong, I think it's uh, a, a third of the time, um, it, it might be a little worse than you thought. But for, you know, the vast majority of times, uh, it's it's not that bad, or it just never happens. So, so why are we worrying? And, and the idea, and I, I think this is something that can help a lot of people, is that the, when we worry, and then things go right, which is probably going to, right? Nine, nine out of 10 is going to happen. It's going to be okay. When we worry, there's a pattern that we set up, right? So, so we're essentially programming ourselves to believe that the worry, and we're not thinking about this on a conscious level, but the worry was somehow responsible for the good outcome, right? So then we just do that again and again. So that's an example of, of one of the tools within that toolbox, um, to be aware of it and to start just really focusing on on trying to look at things realistically and and trying to focus on on the positive. So, one example. Yeah. And you you say be aware of your feelings. And do you think sort of people are not they don't want to sort of think deeper about how they're feeling because you know they're either uh, in an abject fear mm-hmm. or they've. Uh, pull themselves back from society. I, I think yes, you're right, and and I think they're exhausted. I think a lot of us are just mentally exhausted, right? So you know, um, pulling back uh, and not thinking about our feelings, it just seems to be the best way to deal with it. But it's not. It never is, right? And you may not be ready, uh, but at some point you you will have to work through. And I think that's something that uh, you know that everybody needs at some point to, to explore. And you talk about, uh, healing from loss and complicated grief. Yes. And I never thought about sort of grief in terms of this, but you very well articulate that this is a kind of grief. It is. It is. I mean, because we, we have lost some things and we've lost, we lost, we've lost, uh, for now, uh, our way of life that we're and look at that people are not good with change, right? But for the most yeah. part, I, I, yeah. I, and, and that's a, that's a hard thing to, to deal with. But when you, when you're dealing with change on top of all of this and the restrictions and, and the, in the uncertainty, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a very hard thing to deal with. Absolutely. What, what do, would you recommend people to do who read this and, and say, yeah, you know what I am in in a period of grief. I think first of all understand where the grief is coming from, and and if and if I think you're like most people who um, are just knocked down from the pandemic, um, understand what it has done. That's why in this book I tried to to set up in, in a in a particular way. You know where where we were, where it came from, and how we got here. Media's role, uh, and, and then of course. Um, 
identifying the specific ways that it has impacted us. With that knowledge, then somebody can look at it and say, well, how does this relate to me? Um, and, and I think that a lot, like I saw myself in a lot of these. My wife yeah. asked me, um, <laughs> she said, is this um, something that's been therapeutic for you? And I said, I, I can't say that because it's different when you're writing a book. But I, I can say that I, I recognized some things, some behaviors and some perceptions and things like that in myself. Uh, and it helped me to define them, you know, more, uh, more productively. Yeah. Um, you uh, also ask a very big question. Uh, is our world really that fragile? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an eye opener. And, and, you know, part of it is, look, depending on, on, you know, <laughs> how you grew up, where you grew up, and, and, and where you live right now in the world, uh, our, our perspectives can be vastly different, right? And I think in our part of, and I, I use the, um, the, the G20 team, you know, our G20 team, we've had it pretty good, you know, haven't we? Yeah, and, and when we hear about things happening in the world and, and political unrest leading to uh, dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, um, pandemics, famine, you know, all the biggies. And it's unfortunately for, for many people, uh, I think it's, it's easier to rather than digest that and say, you know, is there anything I can do um, to just say, well, that's them, right? Um, gosh, we're out of time, but I want to ask you, what is something good that you feel came from all of this? Anything? From the pandemic, I, I hope um, that we're aware of what's most important in life. I, I hope that, you know, if we do have a new normal, if we, if we can say there's something good about a new normal, it's maybe that we take stock and we say, what is it that, can, that needed to change? And can we make the change be a positive thing, not just for ourselves, but for our global citizens, our global fellow person? Thank you so much. Thank you. The book is tremendous, and um, I I really do believe that it is a, a, a an important read. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. Very good. Well, that's all for this episode of Scribes and Songsters. It went far too quickly. Many thanks to our guest Stephen Kristoff. Thanks to our Scribes and Songsters team producer Liz Pettipis Phillips. Technical producer and editor Gary Glass, consultant Brian Sweet, and our social media manager Michelle Fortier. Thanks also, many grateful thanks to Tony Toldo and the Toldo Foundation, and also to Neil and Tina Queering for their support. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you soon, right back here on Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Bye for now.